this if you met me in the morning, I'm still part of Ross. And, uh, so I'm still very uh, anxious to be here. Um, I believe this, that it is not by chance, but it is by choice that you will put your head on a pillow at night and fall asleep in a country that's free. And those choices have been made by the three women that will be on this panel. It is their dedication, it is their professionalism, and it is the sacrifices that they have made that um, give us a, um, a confidence and a uh, security that uh, I think you've heard today mentioned around the world that not all souls have. So with that said, I would like to introduce first uh, Colonel Teresa Wolfgang, and I am going to uh, certainly apologize a little here. Um, I'm wearing a Marine Corps pin here, so uh, when I get the, when I get into the, um, you know, uh, I think we all know the 101st Airborne Division, which I see here, and a few other of uh, the uh, Army components. Testimony. You stepped up and bringing that back. 
That mission is to help youth and, and to um, impact crime in Harrisburg by providing educational, athletic, and recreational activities for children. Officer Jenkins joined the police department in 2005 and is a graduate of Harrisburg Area Community College and has earned more than 14 awards within the department and has successfully uh, helped solve three homicides. As the panel talks about, this is uh, non-traditional sort of roles that uh, women have. And if anything, we could lead off with uh, the personal experiences in uh, what many see as very, very demanding fields, both with the armed forces and certainly serving as a police officer. Whichever you prefer. Do we pray to have to have a Well, we're looking sort of at uh, a non traditional role, mm -hmm. taking on those responsibilities that have been sort of gender specific for men and uh, how you would have sort of tackled those and uh, what the success has been. Right. Well, as a police officer, um, it is very interesting to um, go in and as a female to get the same respect as a male in many situations. Um, one of the things that I learned over the years was to be myself because that's what got me through most of my situations and with the times where I tried to be a male and tried to act as though a male would act it actually didn't work out that well for me. Uh -huh. So, um, but uh, it takes a while to actually get the uh, respect of the community and also the, um, the, uh, the male officers. Um, it, immediately when you come into this, this field, they want to see how strong you are and, and um, how you handle situations and you're almost like, they look at you um, differently and not on, a, not on a fair plane as everyone else. So. Um, I noticed that um, I had to prove myself over at least two or three year period before I was respected in, in my field. Um, and I did over and above what the male officers did. And still, till eight years later, I still don't have as, the same respect as male officers. So, um, and the way I see that will change is that we um, continue put pressure on to have women in leadership, even in the police force, because they paved the way for other females coming through the police department. Um, it's very easy for for um, the male gender to point out what the females doing it wrong when all their lead when all the leadership is male as well. You know, so if you have a lead a female uh, leader, they tend to understand what how a woman thinks and I just recently had a, uh, a conversation with uh, our chief saying, you know, women are different. We think differently, we make decisions based on different, you know, aspects of the situation. And some people respect the way we think and some people just cannot take it. <laughs> so, you know, I said, and you just gotta sift through that because we think a lot differently. So that's how, you know, my experience as a police officer and being around the male gender, we're just a different species. <laughs> I would second that. Um, having been in the military 26 years, I think Jenny was spot on when she said that um, it's important to be yourself. Many times now, I'm sure you've seen the same thing where we have superior female officers who are good and they are competent, but they try too hard. And by trying too hard, it's very easy to see. Um, it's very easy to see through that. So it's important to be yourself and, and be in positions that you can succeed at. Don't, hopefully you're not put in a position because you are a female. It's gotta be a position that you, you are the, the best qualified for. Um, one of the challenges that I find with myself is that, and this is probably the same for most of you women, um, and this is women in, in general, is that not only do we want to do everything, uh, but we wanna do everything well. We're, we're not happy with, I'm an okay police officer right. or an okay officer. I want to be the best officer and I want to be the best mother and the best wife. 
and that just can't happen. So you need to be able to find balance within your life and um, prioritize and, and make sure that um, you keep that balance in check. Otherwise, when things get out of balance, then everything gets lopsided, and that's where it starts negatively impacting your career. Thank you. Um, definitely. Um, I tend to break it up into a pre-9-11 world and a post-9-11 world for females. Um, we've been at war for over 10 years. And uh, we've grown up as a military force. When I came in the Army at the 101st Airborne Division, the highest ranking female I saw was a captain. Now we're starting to see in 05 and in 06, it's becoming um, the norm. and. After 9-11, and regardless of anyone's political views, we have been at war, and uh, bullets don't discriminate. And um, when you're out there, people don't discriminate, and they don't tell you, oh, okay, Colonel Wolfgang, you have to go back to the vehicle because you can't be here. No, no, uh, uh, we're seen as a, um, it really is a great equalizer. So, um, I have been myself. I've taken on some very challenging positions, but I have gotten the training that I needed to be the same as my male counterparts. I jumped school, went to airborne school, I earned my combat action badge and three IED accidents. You know, um, so again, um, you have to be very comfortable with yourself. You also have to push yourself and just know that you can have it all, that you may not have it all at once, mm -hmm. and our lives are long, and everything comes in chapters for us. Mm -hmm. So what um, personality or temperament, um, along with skills and qualifications, do you see women needing to um, sort of be as successful as men? For the military, definitely, if you have not heard of Myers-Briggs or have taken mm -hmm. that psychological test, um, you should take it. I am an ENTJ. Um, if you come back as more as a feeler or a perceiver, you may want to rethink going into the Army. <laughs> or you can say, okay, you know, I have that. That's how I see the world. But for the military, I need to be able to pull in my thinking and my judging um, for the leadership skills. So definitely take the Myers-Briggs test. <coughs> you know, bless you. Um, you don't have to be an ENTJ or an ISTJ. It, you know, it really is um, just whatever you are. And just know that when you go into a leadership role, you're going to be required to do some other things. I've seen men also to be not good leaders. You know, so again, it's either it's 2013, so the great equalizer of the military is that we don't have to negotiate our salary because it all determines on, on when we're commissioned. And the salaries are posted on the website. To become an Army officer, you have to have a bachelor's degree. It's recommended now that we have a master's degree. So we do come to the playing field. It is um, very equal. Unlike the private sector, where we're still earning about 82 cents to the dollar. Uh, as far as characteristics, we have a term that we use in the, in the Army specifically called Army Values. We use the acronym leadership. It's the lead. loyalty, duty, respect, um, honor, integrity, personal courage, uh, self, self, uh, personal courage. Um, those things are the key to everything that we do in life. Uh, unfortunately, when uh, I can tell you that any conference I go to, any kind of training event that I go to, I absolutely expect to be one of very few females in that room. So that means everyone's looking at us at all times. They're looking at our hair. They're looking to make sure that we have um, not too much jewelry on. They're looking to make sure that our uniform is the way it's supposed to be. So even when we don't think people are looking, they're looking. And so that's where we need to um, honor. honor. Honor for me is, is the most important characteristic. Because um, if you don't have that, honestly, the next one. <coughs> Well, as a police officer, um, you're dealing with the community um, directly. And a lot of our, our, our job is 80% is communication and 20% is physical. And uh, society really looks at 
the 20%. So again, when women come into law enforcement, they're saying women should, shouldn't be police officers because they physically cannot handle the demands of the job. When they forget that 80% of it is communication. And if you can effectively communicate, you're probably going to get out of a lot of situations that were as someone who doesn't have to worry about communicating can handle the other 20%. <laughs> so <laughs> I have, <laughs> um, as a, I mean, so as a police officer, it's a little bit different than not uh, being at war. Um, it's more of being, having effective communication skills and being able to respect others. Also, um, I would say life skills because as a police officer, when you're going into someone's home and they're having a situation, they don't want to hear somebody who has never been in this situation as far as family, or, you know, you, don't, you haven't had a hardship in your life, you haven't had this, you haven't had that, and you come in and try to give, a, give someone um, advice. So I, I always think that there's a good police officer will have some life experience. Um, and Let's see, we got the communication skills, we have the um, life experience, and uh, I would have to say those are pretty too important and being assertive. You, you, it's like she said, if you oh, back down in any situation, they read you, as soon as you walk into a room, they're reading you. Um, a perpetrator will look you up and down, how you're standing, how you're looking, how nice you're being, how mean you're being, how assertive you are. And if they plan to attack you as a police officer, those are the things that they're looking for. Is this gonna be an easy target or not? So you have to be assertive and stand your ground right, wrong, or indifferent. So those are the three things I would say as a police officer. Do you see each of your fields as one that women are gravitating to, appreciating to the all of the force that we have? But, um, are you seeing more women coming into the field? As a police officer, I still think we are struggling in that area. It's, um, uh, I think for females, you know, knowing how it is, you know, how you, the challenges that you're going to be faced, even with the job and with the own people that you work with, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you have to think twice about if you have that that uh, skin to deal with that because when I when I began police officer, I was in customer service before that, so I was nice and you know, <laughs> oh, how can I help you? And, you know, and when I got into law enforcement, um, you know, nobody really wanted to see me being nice, and every time I was nice, I got kind of a different reaction. So it took me a little while to get a little thicker skin on that end. So it is, I, I think it still is a field that we struggle. So if, if we could recruit more women, put more women in leadership, I think we would open the door for women to um, enter into that field, into at least police officers. As, as far as the military, from my perspective, I just left about a, about a year and a half ago the recruiting retention at the time for the state of PA. And uh, recruiting females was not, in my opinion, the challenge. The challenge was retaining them. So you have a young female who comes into the military, life's great, and all of a sudden life happens, right? They get away, they get married, they have kids, and, and they don't want to or they can't balance, and they make that decision to get out. So from my perspective, the bigger challenge is retaining them in the military not necessarily. I recently got a, a battalion command. Um, I was an airborne um, civil affairs commander, took the battalion to Afghanistan, came back. Um, being a civil affairs officer, I was actually I was the first female battalion commander of that battalion, and um, and I'm about maybe 10 percent of the force, so there's not a lot of women in civil affairs, but they are welcome um, because uh, when I was in Afghanistan, my female soldiers did a lot better because of the culture. Men could not talk to women, so when I had a female civil affairs soldier down at the infantry battalion level, she was welcomed and never turned away. Um, so there's not a lot of women within civil affairs, so we're trying to get 
um, more women in, and it's not because um, for the lack of trying, it's just that when we do get commissioned, it's very hard to change your branch. Mm -hmm. If you go ahead and get commissioned as a signal officer or as a quartermaster officer, you're pretty much stuck with it until you get to be about a captain and then you can choose a functional area. But definitely, um, civil affairs is a branch that women can grow in and they can actually be very successful in. I've worked in the Middle East for 18 years. I've never had someone tell me, I'm not gonna talk to you because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. And that sort of goes to the next question as far as um, thriving um, or professional growth um, relies on the right structure, but um, if you can elaborate maybe a little bit more on the professional growth, um, either through um, educational opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, for the military, we are lifelong um, going to school, you say. I mean, it is expected for an officer to have at least two master's degrees. It is expected, of, you know, um, for us to go down and get our joint qualification time. That means working with our Marine counterparts. <laughs> 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 and working with our Navy okay. counterparts, right. and so going in, you know, um, um, you always want to go and get your education. Now, there are certain steps that, you know, I had to take to get this rank, um, just like my male counterparts did. Uh, I'm looking at a PhD program, so again, it's getting the education. Civil affairs, psychological operations, those are some great fields, and with the unfortunate acts in Boston. I have a feeling that the war on terror, terrorism is another field that is about ready to open up even more. And these are some fields that women can be very, very successful in. Again, as I said before, it's unfortunate. 9-11 um, was a game changer. It changed how we thought. And for the military, prior to 9-11, we were not deployed in a long time. Uh, we had not experienced an all-out war. I mean, we had Operation Just Cause, which is a small one. We had Grenada, which we were all very tiny. After 9-11, uh, we've been at war for over a decade. And men and women, you know, African-American, white, Asian, I mean, um, we've all served out there, and um, we've all made these strides going forward. And it really is just a, um, just a, um, a natural progression, uh, you know, because we're starting to grow up. I hope I answered your question. Back in 1986 when I enlisted, I enlisted, my purpose for enlisting was, um, my, my dad was a Vietnam veteran, and uh, no other came out that served in the military in my family, so that was an added benefit. But I, I mainly joined because of the college money. Um, and I remember years ago, I don't remember who said it, but there was somebody that I put it laughed at because he made a comment that um, poor people join the military and that non-educated folks are in the military pity us. And that is so very far from the truth. Um, the master's degree that I have from Duquesne University, a very prestigious school, I don't mind sharing with you the fact that I spent $1,000 for that. I paid for books. That's it. The military paid for the whole time. Um, we have an incredible tuition assistance program, educational assistance program, the GI Bill. I mean, the military, and it doesn't really matter if you're an officer, enlisted male or female. Uh, the military absolutely encourages everyone to become more and more educated, and they pay for it. Well, police officers don't have that same requirement. <laughs> <laughs> We, it, it, it's, it's interesting because there's it's such a different um, uh, world as far as the military because you're dealing with people um, in, on an average level where as far as, um, let's say for instance, as a police officer, we have to have a lot of intuition as far as what's going on, someone's telling us the truth if we, uh, we can read their body language, those types of things. So we have training in those areas. So you would have training as far as um, investigative techniques and you know those type of things. We have a yearly 
um, updates for our laws to make sure that we know what laws have changed and we also have to um, make sure that we are firing um, our weapons is up to par. Um, but as far as, far as um, college education, there is no put, um, push on that as far as the police department is concerned. Now I am currently enrolled in E-Town to finish up my bachelor's degree. But that's just, I did that because of the fact that I am moving up the chain of command. That's my goal. And as a leader, I, would, I want to be able to lead by example. So um, if I was, if God would bless me with being a captain or chief of my department, I will uh, lead my troops into the going, because that's my personal, you know, view on life that you should have an education. Um, but that's the reason why I'm doing it. So it's a little different. We're not required to um, have a college education, um, but we are required to know our laws and, and specific things regarding policing. You know that you brought the mentee with you, and the next question is certainly for all of you, but um, would you recommend the field to a uh, young woman who is uh, interested? That's no pressure on, <laughs> on you guys. <laughs> I've, I've, I've talked to uh, Shay. Shay Shibisher is my uh, mentee. She wants to be a police officer. She's a senior in, at John Harris High School. And um, I want her to know how, what it's like to be a police officer. So she does take the role on that she knows what to expect. I don't want her to go in thinking it's one thing and it's not. Um, I love my job. I love being a police officer. I love working the streets. I love solving problems. I love finding the, the truth out. And you know, I think that's women. <laughs> right? That's the best investigators there are. So, you know, I just love being able to come to, um, and when you said the three homicides, I it was, you know, I just had to get to the bottom of it. Why did this happen? Who was involved? And use my communication skills and my relationships in the community to get the answers and get the people to tell me what happened. So I love my job. Um, but then there's really tough things about it, and that is when you're stomping on somebody's, you know, you know, and you're, you're no, that's really tough when you're in there. You're fighting for your life, and you're fighting to um, save your partner's life. And I was in situations like that where. Um, uh, someone was pointing a gun at my partner and they're fighting and he's fighting for his life and I'm there trying to save his life and it's hands on. Um, so if you can handle that, yes, become an officer because you, you got to have to take the good with the bad. And um, But those are, those are experiences that I'm proud of that I saved my partner's life. So, you know, if nothing ever else comes out of it, I say to him, like, I'd be a police officer. So, I'd say if, um, if you can handle that and you like those kind of things, yes, become a police officer. Yeah, Denny again, you're spot on. Um, <laughs> I agree with everything she said. Fair enough, Denny, for the Paris, we're going to hit off the scene. I hate that way. But no, she truly is right that you need to go into these. Professions understand what you're getting yourself into. When you're in a predominantly male field, you have to work extra harder and, and be a little bit more vigilant about the way you're conducting yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm a vet, combat veteran. My husband's a combat veteran, and um, I have an 18-year-old son who, uh, well, I'll say about him in a second. But um, when I had deployed, I got back in May of 2004. My husband deployed in February of 2005, so about 10 months in between. He was gone for 18 months. So when he came home, my daughter at the time was five years old. And so I missed the first day of her kindergarten, which is another thing you have to accept that if you pick the military as a profession, you're going to miss some pretty key uh, parts of your life and your family's life. Uh, my sister got married, and I was going to be a major of honor. Obviously, I couldn't do that from Skype. So you know, you miss some pretty key events in your family's life. So um, about a year after my husband get, gets back, my, my son is about 10 at the time. He said to me, um, I said, well, I made a comment and I said, Brennan, do you think you'd ever join the military? And he looked me dead in the face and he said, I would never leave my family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a mom, that's 
like the words that kind of makes my skin crawl even saying it. Uh, so we, we were in a church in Hilton one evening, and I had like $7 worth of items. And there's a lady behind us that obviously, well, she appeared not to have a lot of money. And she said, I was paying at the register, and she said, I'd like to buy the sergeant's items for her. And I looked at her, I said, ma'am, you don't have to do that. She said, I'd really be honored if you let me. And I said, okay, well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. She said, thank you for your service. So my son was with me. This is where he had his epiphany. <laughs> so we go out, we get the car, and we could tell the wheels were turning. He said, Mom, why did that lady do that? I said, well, why do you think she did it? She doesn't even know me, Mom. Do you think she did it for me? Or do you think she did it for this? And to this day, I'll never forget the look in his face. He looked at me and he smiled. And all he said to me was, I get it. I said, you know, there's a lot of really important people with really important professions. There's police officers, doctors, teachers. Do you think they get told thank you? He said, probably not. So I'm very proud to tell you that last October, he enlisted in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, um, it's always a story about the show. I'm Army Graf, also. My father, um, a Vietnam veteran, um, he was a Special Forces Sergeant Major. So I had no choice in becoming an officer. <laughs> <laughs> I was all prepared to enlist, and he says, no, the only way I would see a pair of combat boots was if I was an officer, obviously, so I joined. Um, I would absolutely recommend it, because I wake up every day thanking God that I was born in this country. Um, you know, having been to Afghanistan, worked female engagement, been to Iraq, I lived in Egypt, I lived in Korea, I grew up in Panama, you know, as a small child, Despite all of our problems and all of our issues, this is still the best country in the world to be a part of. And so it just makes me um, just want to work harder. And I tell people, um, because they tell me, and I'm pretty sure they tell you too, oh, I could never wear a uniform. I could never go to Afghanistan. I could never go to Iraq. Yes, you can. There's a lot of things that people can do. They just need to put their mind to it to do it. And so I tell people, especially girls who come up and ask me, um, what's it like to jump out of an airplane? I didn't have a choice. My father was airborne. I had to be airborne. And I took an airborne battalion command. And yes, I hurt carrying a 30-pound pack jumping out of an airplane, but I pumped off the drop zone just like my guys did. And you know, so but I tell people, I was like, look, serve your country. Go into the military for three years. If you want to be an officer, go to college. And then go into the Army for three years. Three years out of your entire life is a small chapter. If you want to join after high school and then go be a police officer, go do that. But I'll tell you, you join the military, you come out after three years with an honorable discharge, and with veterans benefits where you can buy a house with zero down, where you can go to college and not have to come out with $100,000 in student loans and also you can serve your country. So if you're thinking about the military, if you have somebody this thinking about it, three years out of your long life that we're living is not a lot to give up. And who knows? You could go off to Korea like I did and go, oh, wow, this is great. <laughs> or you go live in Egypt you know, and go ride the camels. I mean, all the things that people save up their lives to do, we have gotten to do it free of charge and to serve our Any other things that you would like to add before we open it up for some questions? Okay. All right. Yeah. Sure. Um, I hear you know Officer Jenkins up there you know talking about how the police force is different from the military, and it is. Um, but I think you guys are are a lot alike in ways that maybe some you don't realize, you know, um, I know you said about, you know, your education isn't mandatory. In the military, it's not mandatory either, but you're going to have a lot harder time moving up. And a lot of, you know, like these ladies, a lot of them do get their degrees because they want to lead by example, because when, you know, especially as a woman in a traditionally male profession, when you get to that role of leadership, people scrutinize everything you do and they look at you and they say, you know what, you were put there because you were a woman. What were you doing that you got there? And when you get there, you want to make sure that you're beyond that scrutiny. You want to say, look, I have a master's, what do you have? Look, I can do this. I'm here, you know, an hour before everybody else and I stay an hour after everybody else and my phone rings 40 times, you know, when I leave work and I still go and do this. 
so that I can better your life, so that I can be that person that you need me to be. And so I think in a lot of ways you guys are alike, and at the same time you, know, you were talking about you know, having to fight for your partner's life, you know, I think that's one of the benefits actually of being in a profession like you all. You know, when I was in the military, I did eight years um, enlisted active duty, and um, my very first command, I served under an officer um, who was a, a man, and he was very old fashioned, um, you know, old school military, and he said to a lot of us younger folks who had just come from boot camp, he said, look at the person around you. He said, you are not a female, you are not a male. He said, you're all sailors. He said, and no matter what your difference is, where you came from, who you were before you got here, forget about it. Because someday, you might need that person next to you to save your life. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest, greatest thing I had ever heard. Because I did, I came from small town Pennsylvania. You know, I had never met a different person of color or religion or anything like that until I was in high school. And then the military was a bigger shock. I mean, I went to a carrier, that was my first command, that's 5,000 people from all over the place with different backgrounds and, and different lessons. And so it, it is a great thing because you, you don't have the option to quit. You don't have the option to say, I'm not dealing with you and walk away. You have to, you know, you live, you eat, you sleep with these people. In some cases, you live or die with these people. You know, so you are forced almost to develop these negotiation skills, these abilities to overcome your personal, you know, that, that factor that I don't like you, but we have a job to do and we're going to do it. You know, and, and like you said, you know, women in general have that, I want to be the best. And so they will push their counterparts to be that best person, you know. Um, and like you were saying, you know, women who have a family, you know, they, they go in, they're young, life happens, you know. I think that traditionally male professions like that kind of almost force you to grow up a little bit faster um, than, say, like our college counterparts or civilian counterparts. And so you do, you, you know, you, you want to meet that guy and get married and have kids and, and all that happens and then you go, oh, well, now what? You know, um, my family had a very tough time because I have two sons and I had them both while I was in the military. And, um, you know, they said, how could you do that? My mom got out of the army because she had me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I always wondered to her because she never went to college. She never, you know, she, she raised her family. That's what she did. And I said, mom, you know, how, how do you wait 40 some years to go to college? You know, I mean, was I really that big of an inconvenience, you know? And, and, you know, when I raise my, my kids, you know, and I look at them and they're six and they're three, you know, and I was gone for, you said, you know, first words, you know, walking, you know, and, and it's very hard. But when you look at that and you think about the life that you're providing for them and the role model, the example, you know, you, like you said, you've been to college, you've seen the world, you've done all these things. I've done all those, you know, I have photos from places in the world that my kids, you know, dream about, about, you know, they see it on the Travel Channel, the History Channel, you know, we've been there, and the government paid for us to do that, you know, I am a veteran, you know, I have an honorable discharge, I am currently going to school on the 9-11 GI Bill, the 9-11 GI Bill is not only paying for my education and paying for my books and all that, but it's supporting my family so I can go to school, yeah. I came home and I had nothing, you know, they, they joke about, you know, once you leave, you can't go back. It's real. I mean, I had no family support. I had no job. I had two weeks' notice to move my entire household home. And that GI Bill saved my life. I mean, it pays for a housing site. It pays for my tuition. It really is a difference. And I think that, you know, that's one of the biggest, you know, equalizers and, and one of the great things about being a woman in a male profession like that is, you know, especially one like that where it is an equalizer because everybody wants the same thing. You, know, you all want to stay alive. You all want to do a job, and it's the same job. So, historically, uh, there's an argument to be made that the GI Bill and my father received his bill commission on the island of Iwo Jima sent more men to college and significantly elevated all of us as a result of that first GI Bill getting, at that time, and very few women, into um, college. Last month, the Guard um, sponsored the first Women's Veteran Weekend at Gettysburg. And approximately 300 women veterans from Pennsylvania attended. It was tremendous. Hopefully so. This will be, as this is, that next annual um, event. Women ranging from a 92-year-old woman, Marine, who when wheeled up sort of to get our picture taken, said she would not have 
have a picture in her chair, she'd stand as all of us. So then, younger women too, uh, experiencing that which sort of we've all stood on someone's shoulders. Uh, reach out a hand to bring somebody else up and um, had experiences that those women before me and those women following me um, will have for all those you know still to come. I was one of four women officers on the island of Okinawa 100 years ago. <laughs> it feels like 100 years ago. I mean, it only feels 100 years ago. We talked about the, uh, you know, ESTJ or TSTJ. Um, my husband and I are at the um, Naval War College, and of course everybody takes a test. Well, that's fine. Well, the women, the wives of the Marines took the test. The wives were all the same. <laughs> Naval Academy um, graduation, and I will yell the word to be Army, and we have, but that's another story too. <laughs> so I would um, ask if there are any other questions. Yes, ma'am. I want to thank you for coming today, and um, also thank you all for serving. I want to um, touch on the question. It's not a problem of recruiting women, but um, maintaining them within the field, and it can apply to all three of you. Um, I want to say my mom is retired military, um, 20 years in service, in the 70s and 80s, and um, birthed four children while in the service, and um, retired when I was five, but um, raised them as well. And I want to ask a question. She was a staff sergeant, he says, that. but um, ask the question of what is being done to help maintain them within the service? Um, I know that there's like, with the military, there's ch uh, child care on the barracks and things like that. So is there anything being done to help maintain them? I'm not aware of any specific policies or programs, but what I can say in my current assignment, I'm the Deployment Cycle Support Division Chief, and what that means is anything that touches a soldier or airman's life or their family. For example, if we have a young, and this happens not often, but it we have a young female soldier who can't get to drill because she can't she babysit her, something happened to babysit her for a week. Um, so that unit will come together and, and find maybe a spouse of another service member that can watch her kids so she can attend drill. What, we, what I don't think we want to start getting into is, is segregating. In other words, saying, well, the females don't have to come and get um, child care issues because there are single male soldiers as well. Uh, so we got to be careful and maintain one standard. But um, you know, when we use the term military family, uh, I do not believe that we use that term loosely. We sincerely mean that we're part of a military family, we're part of a family, we take care of each other. Um, so those are the kind of things that we can help each other with. Now there's other organizations out in the community, uh, maybe a daycare that wants to do some pro bono daycare work. Uh, there's other agencies that partner with the military, the military resource that can provide free or reduced child care. So those, those type of things we look towards. Okay. Uh, you talked about relating to the women in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the local women. Yes. How did you relate to, how was your relationship with the Afghan men who would look down on a woman being in your role or a hard time? Um, that's not, okay, yes, um, that is an exception. Um, female soldiers in Afghanistan were like a third gender, okay? Um, they know we're women, but we wear the uniform. And they recognize my patch, which is civil affairs, and that comes with money. I manage $99 million. They also know our rank structure. And when I was in Afghanistan, I was her rank, and I was a battalion commander, so they knew oh, I need to talk to Colonel Wolfgang. I don't need to talk to Sergeant so-and-so because Colonel Wolfgang outranks her. Mm -hmm. So the Afghan men, and I was just talking with Donna about this, are very shrewd businessmen. Mm -hmm. All Afghans are because they survived the Taliban and the Russians and us. <laughs> so, but um, <laughs> how I I uh, went about with female engagement, it's, it's part of the civil affairs, okay? Because we engage 100% of the population. If we engage 49% of the population, that means 51% of the females are not being engaged. So I started looking at it as family engagements. 
because family, everyone can relate to family. It doesn't matter if you're here in the States, Afghanistan, Pakistan, everyone can relate to family. And because I was told by an Afghan woman, and she's a Project Artemis graduate, if I bypass that unemployed male and go to his wife and say, I'm going to give you training, I'm going to give you an education, um, that resentment is just going to increase, and then she's going to get beat even more. So we attempted to, by talking about the family unit and by um, raising the family unit up, it also will raise the wife status up also. So again, it's um, I never had a man who didn't want to talk with me because I was like, oh, okay, I know you're a woman, but you're in uniform, so it's okay. And I'm a colonel, so they knew I came with money. And if I could just add something there, I, I'm really perplexed too that how we get that impression, because I was in the military, but I've had no problem talking to Muslim men, including some of the most militant. They all will engage and talk to me with respect. So I don't, I just don't know where that comes from. Because honestly, I've been all over the world and, and reporting on Islamic affairs and never had a man whose head of Islamic movements refused to meet. I had to cover me, but they still talk and engage with respect. Now, I was thinking more if you're out in a more remote village, the further out you get, the harder it is. I live there. Mm -hmm. And the further out you get, the harder it is. And, and what that's province? What, pardon me? In what province? What oh, province? Uh, oh, I was, ah, uh, this was many years ago. But in, I lived in Bishop, so I okay. was there. Mm -hmm. So but, I, but, I tried to, but again, that, that's right here because I was in Peshawar too, and I was, did a lot of my reporting from Pakistan along the Afghan border. Went to madrasas and everything. And so I, I, it must be so. I mean, I'm really struggling to figure out why is a different experience. No, I wondered with military to military if uh, there was a difference. I see. That's that's where I'm not dealing with families as much, but military to uh -huh. I didn't see a difference either because. Um, the best thing about the American military is that um, when we train, we train the soldiers like our soldiers get trained. And so they definitely understand um, the rank structure. And you know, and even when I was a second lieutenant in Saudi Arabia, I never had any issues either. Well, I was there prior to Taliban, et cetera. So then it was easy, mm -hmm. as long as you respected them. But I was curious as to how it was after all. Um, no, I saw the movie uh, Zero Dark Thirty, and at the end of the movie, I'm seeing Good Girl, but she got, you know what I mean? <laughs> See, and I'll, let, I'll, let, I'll let someone on the panel to explain the movie. But literally, I'm on my couch, just, and even though she wasn't a military personnel, and she was a government official fighting politics as you mentioned across gave the decision earlier. Um, but how is it in regards to each one of you, how hard or how difficult has it been when you've had that gut instinct um, to to engage your you know your higher officers or you know how, how hard was it to convince them that you were moving in the right direction or that you had you know you just you just knew that you were you were on point or you were on target. Um. I've always been taught, and I um, tell this to my soldiers, fight the battles that you can fight. Choose your battles, because you can't fight every single battle. So you have to pick and choose your battles. And um, sometimes you, know, you have to look at the big picture, because um, there are times we get so passionate about an issue that we can't see you know, what's out here. So regardless of the issue, you really have to pick and choose. And you know, and then you just move forward from there because um, you can be right and you can be spot on point, but if it's the wrong time, wrong place, you're still going to get shot down. Mm -hmm. Can you probably tell me? Well, yeah, I uh, I work directly for the chief, so there's a lot of times where I have issues and um, situations that I want to address or. Um, and I found that, just as she said, pick the ones that you know 
you can accomplish because the more successes you have, the more believable you are when the time comes for the right situation. So um, that's how I've been able to move forward is, okay, I see a situation and I, I come with the, you know, the problem solving skills and, and I give him the whole scenario and then once we address the issue the way I, I, I said we should address it and there's a successful outcome, the next time it's so much easier to get it done because you know, as you as you achieve success, you know, the person up above you is the one who, you know, looks good because everything goes down, um, you know, goes through the ranks and so forth. So that's that's how I you know, I, and then I was just born blessed with good problem solving skills. <laughs> no, and I, I say that um, there is no greater compliment than to be trusted. Right. And by delivering uh, successes, as you said, um, you establish yourself as that sort of subject matter expert through school, through training, through a variety of things. And you continuously build upon those successes. So then when you walk in, and you simply say, this is that moment that I need all of your support, all of your political capital, whatever you want, you then have that confidence, as do everyone who's working for you, and then who you're working for, to say, you know what, we're going to move forward on this. So I couldn't tell it. I'm not sure how true to life the movie was, because when everything happened and they, they got Bin Laden, you heard all about the Navy SEALs, but you didn't hear about that sister behind the scenes who was saying, for 11 years, this is where he is going there and get him. And I couldn't find it in the distinction in the movie. Was it, like you said, was it just not good timing, or did they not trust her because she was a female? And that, I couldn't really tell in the movie. I don't know if it was because of the movie and that was the drama of the movie, but that, that is more or less my, my question. I, I can tell you that if I served with a female like her, she'd make me nervous. Okay. She was very, very erratic, very <laughs> very emotional. Right um, on the glass, like she would kill me with that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. she, yeah that, see, that would have set me off the edge. Okay, that's what but, I thought. But, you know, those kind of things, um, those kind of things are important to, to recognize that she, as good as she was, she was just very passionate, but the, did many of you see the movie? It's, you know, when she starts writing a number of days on the guy's window, that would have set you over the edge yeah. about day three. Right. Um, but I, I think that's part of it is that I don't know that they completely trusted her because I don't know that I would. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I have a, a, just a, I guess a need to hear some of your um, stories or examples where maybe being a woman actually helped you in a situation <coughs> because you know, you hear about women kind of assimilating within male-dominated institutions and I think those male-dominated institutions have a lot to learn from women. So I'm kind of curious if your, um, you know, some of your, your, your personal attributes or some of your decision-making skills maybe that differed from your male count counterparts helped you in certain situations. Do you have any stories about that? I, I would give you an example of when I was in the recruiting battalion. First female recruiting battalion commander in the state of PA. PA is the third largest guard in the nation. Uh, we have 19,000 service members. It's the third largest, third only to California, Texas. And um, many times we would have recruiters. We only had, out of a force of 243 recruiters, we had five females out of 243 recruiters. Many times they would have challenges with parents of the young folks that were thinking about this thing. Who was the first person they called? That would be me. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to their mom as a mom? So that, that definitely helped us, help them get some numbers too. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, being a woman in law enforcement, I think I've had a lot of success because one, I am a woman, and two, because I am Latina. Mm -hmm. and working in the community that I work, uh, those are two good things to have. Um, I've been able to solve a lot of um, crime because I can relate. And my approach is um, more of a um, friendlier approach. And I don't, uh, 
I don't intimidate, I won't intimidate someone. I won't force them to give me the information. I just engage in a conversation. <laughs> and yeah, it's great. And they start talking. And they start talking. <laughs> um, and you know, and, and it's, 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 all, it's like everything. Um, if you can make the person feel comfortable, they're more, more likely to work with you and you're gonna get what you want. And then when they see me, um, they know, they, 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 they sometimes think they may get out of it because, um, you know, Latina, and they may be Latino too. And, um, but I can use that to my advantage to get the job done. And um, I do believe there, being a woman does change the scenario for mo when most men are the, um, usually the one committing the crime, and I'm a female dealing with them. They don't feel that, that machismo um, you know, dealing with the men, it, it automatically sometimes the wall goes up when you're dealing with a with a male officer, and I don't get that. So there is a push. Can you go into? Um, I would say for me, and um, especially being a civil affairs officer when we're out and about with the local population, and just. And um, just what Jenny said, um, we tend to be um, less intimidating to um, a lot of people. Even though I'm carrying an M4, and I, um, I have my M4 in front of me, I've got my nine back here, I'm all suited up, I've got 50 pounds of gear on. Um, when they know that I'm a woman, they feel that they can talk. And so that's where I can actually um, draw out other things. And um, I've been very successful with that. Also, uh, when I put the uniform on, I tend not to think of myself as a female or, you know, I am a soldier. And when I was a battalion commander, I was a battalion commander. And I knew that I was in a fishbowl because I was only one of, one of two female battalion commanders serving in Afghanistan at the time. So I knew I was being watched. I mean, trust me when I say this, people knew I was going to PT and I passed my PT test before I even got back to the showers. <laughs> it is just like that. So I took on the persona of, hey, I'm a battalion commander, and when people s saw me mentoring both men and women, that's when I gained a lot of credibility because I didn't gravitate towards females. And I think sometimes females say, oh, I have a female battalion commander, therefore all females are gonna, no, it's not like that. You know, it's sometimes tougher for the females in it really is tougher. Um, I've never had a female mentor that's been in the military. I've had some of the best males. Um, and when I became a commander, I decided to change that and I was paid a very good compliment by one of my senior, um, she was starting first class and she comes up to me and she says, thank you for mentoring me because I've known a lot of senior females that will talk at you and not to you. Because I talked about education education, education. Everything that came out of my mouth was, so you finish your bachelor's, okay, going for your master's, right? So again, because when we're all educated, that is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, ma'am, I had a question on um, this morning that had been done with um, this happening here in this country. Is there going to be a change in how um, the security of this country is going to
the, uh, the uh, FBI and CIA not doing what they need to do to keep us safe. So, so you don't see a military presence to do that? Right? that that's actually against the law. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even when um, one of the one of the proudest things about the national government perspective is our community service. You know, there's a flood, if there's a storm, they don't. Sorry, they don't call the Marines. They call they call the national guard. <laughs> 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 that colonel is correct. That that's against the law. You, you won't see even if, if it's some kind of a riot or something. I would find it hard to believe that they'd start handing guns to national guards and they block them out of the streets. If that happens, um, then we're probably in a pretty bad way. And at that point, doesn't really matter. But it has happened in effect in the past. They called out the National Guard and when we did the marches down in Mississippi. I'm um, sorry. Um, you would have to stay open. You know what? Um, I'm at the federal level and um, and um, she's at the state level. So the National Guard works for the governor and Governor Corbett can deploy his forces. As far as me, you know, um, we actually focus more going out of the country so and i know that there was a law that was passed recently about posse comitatus and it, you know so again that is always very um, it's very difficult to explain but i can tell you it goes back to our founding fathers and our constitution and and um, it was specifically designed that way um but you know what uh, we have a, one of the best trained police forces whether they're local state um and i've worked with other countries and um, they actually love to get our, you know, um, you know, um, they love to get the state trooper over there. You know, they love to get somebody like Jenny over there for a year to train. So again, it's um, um, unfortunately um, the events in Boston happened, and I think that the local, state, and federal people all came together and they were able to solve it within 24 to 48 hours, and it was just amazing. Right? I mean, it really was. So um, I'm not going to anticipate anything going um, going to be different. But I know that our probably our police officers are going to be much more vigilant, <laughs> and it's probably going to be some more training yeah. going on. And as I said before, there's going to be a whole new field that's going to open up, and I think this is where um, women can be very successful in the joint terrorism. I mean, it's unfortunate that this career is opening up, but it is. And it's going to be something that, and we all face what we call age discrimination mm -hmm. these days. So, and you know, and that may be a good field for people to get into. I think it's collaboration of intelligence and sharing that information. And uh, if anything, I would certainly hope coming from that community that there is that continual conversation um, rather than, um, you know, uh, information is power, so to speak. But in many, many cases, um, it is that sharing of that information in the manner to those who really do need to know um, that helps uh, prevent, um, solve uh, when an event happens. And uh, I think what you're too referring to is sort of a collection of intelligence on um, Americans. And that is a incredibly um, emotional, complex, and, um, well, Again, we could be here for a couple days oh, okay. on that. Um, drones, um, cameras, Lancaster just rolled out a whole series of cameras. Yeah. To everyone's probably best interest. Mm -hmm. However, then you do have sort of that collection opportunity. So I think that that's going to open up even more of a discussion responsibly. Um, if you simply dump all the information or intelligence on a desk and you haven't analyzed it, it really does not right. much to you. So, so and I think the communication is the key, um, especially uh, seeing that I'm an old person and I've come from an era from civil rights era to today. Um, yeah. You know, I was just going to ask, we can't let you guys leave without hearing from you because we know you're in male-dominated profession. How have you dealt with the harassment? Because we know it's there. What are your techniques? What can you what, what can you give share with the younger women about the sexual harassment? I, honestly, I am not a good person to talk to you about that. You would think by me being a five foot female, right, that I get harassed. I can look you all in the eye and say that I've never seen it. Really? So I won't allow it to happen. I won't allow it to happen. Honestly. But that that means there's some 
a way you can carry yourself is something that warrants it. So, so share a little bit of that because I think it's important. I'll blame that on my mom. Because, um, you know, I, I'm not going to shock any of you, but I've always been short. <laughs> and, so, um, and so, you know, when, when you're small in stature, you're raised a certain way to take care of yourself and don't take anybody's BS. And, and that just, that's just who I am. It's just the way I've always been. And I'm who I am in uniform. And um, honestly, um, I have not been harassed. Well, can... All right, see if you want to answer them. You know what, and I'm five foot three, three inches. <laughs> I wish I had three inches. <laughs> and um, I can honestly tell you that I have not been harassed either. Um, and it is in the way that you carry yourself. Now, yes, it's unfortunate that civilians do hear about the bad things yeah. that happen. Mm -hmm. um, you never hear about the good things. I will tell you that the Army has a zero tolerance policy. And both of us have been battalion commanders. And the Equal Opportunity Program is our program. And as a commander, you are responsible for that at all levels. Um, I will tell you that when I went to Afghanistan, I did have an 06, which I am now. He tried to tell me that he was going to be my raider. And I was like, you're a staff officer. I went to go see the general. And within a matter of days, you know, that 06 was like, OK, back now. <laughs> so again, it's really in how you carry yourself. Because I've had my male counterparts tell me they would not want to get into a room with me if I was angry. Um, well, it's a little different for me. <laughs> 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 See, we're not the um, Well, I guess law enforcement are on a local level is a little bit, a little looser than than the military. So um, when I first came on, immediately, um, even when I was interviewing other police departments, I could see like some differences of treatment. Um, you know, yeah, there was a lot of direct questioning as far as um, my, you know, attractiveness and that I had um, children, and I was asked questions that were different from my male counterparts as far as, um, and I'm not saying my department specifically, I, mm -hmm. I, I interviewed at a lot of places, but I had questions that, um, that asked, you know, was I going to be able to make it to work? Who's going to babysit my kids? And yes, <laughs> but you know, it happened. So um, that's not, the same as sexual harassment, but there is some sexual discrimination as far as I'm concerned in that realm. But um, when I did, when I came on, it immediately um, they, there was a lot of, is she single? Is she good? You know, how 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 could you be a police officer being you know pretty or what have you? And um, so it was a really there. If someone, if I didn't. Somebody was trying to come on to me, and I didn't reciprocate. I got treated. You know, all their friends would be, would you know, they wouldn't come out and say that's the reason, but you can tell. So it happens that his friends are the ones that are treating me a certain type of way. So I did get a little bit of that, and and it's like she said, you have to, you have to respect yourself. And you cannot give in to that behavior. And the more you stand tall and the more you persevere, that that's where you get your respect. And um, if you can, if, if say for instance, a female comes on and, uh, um, after me, I usually sit and have those kind of conversations with them because I don't want them to ruin it for the next person because the more females um, get into that behavior, the harder it you make it for the next female. And, and if there's only three females out of 100 males, you're really lessening the odds for us. So, I mean, there it does happen, but you you have to like, and also you have to address it right away as well because someone um, had said something really. It was just way out of line what they had said, and I in front of everyone, put them in their place. You do not talk to me that way. Mm -hmm. And that's how you have to 
you don't, <laughs> you know, you, some females would just laugh about it, laugh it off because they don't want to, you know, create any uh, friction, but you have to, because it never came out again. That's a leadership skill. That's gender neutral. You have leadership, so all of you ladies, kudos, and extraordinary leadership happens to be the true female. Did I mention I was Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what's on. Uh, put one quick plug in here, and that is for employment. And many of you are in the position um, out there in um, the world, and I would certainly encourage you to hire a vet. There are 28, 28 or 280 um, vets attending Shippensburg right now. And um, I'm not sure what the population here is in town. I should have done my homework, but I'm sure you have on campus uh, veterans up uh, too. So if given that chance, uh, and specifically a woman vet, See the skills, the dedication, the leadership that was mentioned just now um, that's resident here. And uh, I, again, I would encourage you to hire her. Can I say something? Sure. I sit on the board of directors of a homeless veteran shelter. It's a Philadelphia Veterans Comfort House. Females are four times as likely to be homeless um, than our male counterparts. Mm -hmm. So, and I know there's a lot of homeless vets out there. Only 7% of the general population can call themselves a vet, but we make up 13% of the total homeless population. Mm -hmm. So if you are so inclined, it doesn't have to be Philadelphia, I know a lot of you live out here, um, you know, and there's homeless shelters out here also. There are homeless shelters specifically for veterans. And again, if you start to reduce that, hiring more vets, um, we can actually get the total population down. Can I, can I add something to what she said? We do have a local shelter here, Shalom House, that has a homeless women veteran section. So if anybody is interested in getting involved, I know that they would love to have your support. So thank you for bringing that forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, could you join me?